Everybody, uh, welcome to Dublin. Uh, this is our first scientific session, and we're going to start straight away with five minutes uh, talk with two minutes questions afterwards, so we're moving on fairly swiftly. Uh, if I could ask the first presenter, Dr. Schliemann, to come to the podium, please. Good morning, dear chairs, dear ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored to be the first speaker in the first scientific session of this Congress, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, the long head of the biceps and its role in uh, glenohumeral stability. <clears throat> There's no conflicts related to this talk. So um, we know that the biceps causes a lot of problems in both uh, isolated biceps pathologies and more often in rotator cuff and lateral tears. And it often results in just cutting the biceps and taking it off of the glenohumeral joint. But there is some evidence that there is an effect of the biceps tendon on stability, reducing anterior translation and reducing superior migration in cases of uh, cuff tears. But the thing is, we cannot really measure it properly in clinical tests, and biomechanical testings are often static and not really simulating the clinical situation. And in addition, we have an ongoing conflict with the head of our department, Professor Raschke, who was the president of the German Society of Trauma Surgery at the time of the study, and he's a biceps preserver. And Professor Katang and me from the shoulder office who are uh, confessed biceps killers. And this inner clinical conflict uh, made a study on uh, the biomechanical effects of the long head of the biceps absolutely mandatory in our setting. So uh, we took eight uh, human shoulders and um, mounted it to a testing machine that you can see here. It's an industrial robot. Uh, and with a, a distinct software, you can simulate uh, throwing motions and load and shift testing, as we did, and uh, tested the uh, long head of the biceps in three different conditions, unloaded as a passive stabilizer, loaded, and after tenotomy, uh, we started testing with intact cuff muscles and sequentially unloaded uh, the tendons in order to simulate different cuff tear patterns. And uh, muscles were loaded according to the cross-sectional area, as you can see here, as derived from uh, other studies. Um, the outcome parameters during load and shift test was the load required to translate the humeral head anteriorly by uh, five millimeters. And during throwing motion, we measured the maximum translation in either direction of the humeral head against uh, the glenoid. And we hypothesized that there is no effect of the long head of the biceps on stability if uh, the cuff is intact, but in cuff deficiency, the long head of the biceps has a stabilizing effect on the glenohumeral joint depending on the type of cuff lesion. And in cases of tenotomy, uh, the translation would uh, increase. The results of the load and shift test are actually very simple. If it comes to uh, combined lesions and massive tears, there is a significant uh, amount of stability that is generated by the long head of the biceps, uh, not in uh, just um, um, supraspinatus or subscapularis tears, but if it comes to combined lesions, uh, this is actually obvious. It's more complicated in throwing motions. If you have an isolated supraspinatus tear or a totally intact rotator cuff, there is no effect of the long head of the biceps uh, in uh, translation. But as soon as the subscapularis tears, the biceps limits anterior tr translation of the humeral head. And uh, the translation gets even bigger if the uh, biceps is tenotomized. If just the infraspinatus is torn, there is a mild increase in superior translation, but this was actually statistically not significant. In combined tears, first in anterior superior tears, you see uh, an increase in translation when the biceps is unloaded, the direction is anterior superior, and the effect is more aggravated after tenotomy. And in posterior superior tears, the translation changes a little to a more superior direction if the biceps is unloaded, and again, this is more aggravated if the biceps is uh, tenotomized. And in massive tears, you already see massive translation of up to eight millimeters, and uh, there was a difference between internal and external rotation with regard to the direction of translation. So in conclusion, the long head of the biceps stabilizes against anterior superior migration of the humeral head, depending on the exact type of cuff lesion. And this effect is most obvious in the loaded biceps and uh, not obvious uh, after tenotomy. So in the end, our head was actually right. There is a function of the long head of the biceps. But finally, uh, because it causes a lot of problems, we still cut it anyway. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any questions from the floor? I have just one quick question for you. Uh, did you look at the effect of tenodesis on the biceps? Uh, well, no, we just didn't do it. We believe that um, 
the unloaded effect is kind of a tenodesis because it, it, uh, it remains a passive stabilizer, but um, uh, we do it in, a, in, a, in the next step. So this was actually part of a cutting study, uh, and there is some more studies going on, and maybe I can report on that next time. Thank you very much. Elegant study. So if there are no, no more questions, we move on to the second presentation. And I call Dr. Spanning to talk us about the O'Brien the brain test and its significance. Hello, my name is Sanne van Spanning. Um, I'm from Amsterdam and I did my research fellowship in uh, ANSI with uh, Dr. Lafos. And I'd like to start by thanking the organization for the opportunity to present our, the results of a recent study on the diagnostic value of the O'Brien test. There were a few con conflicts of interest. Three of the authors were consultants in the industry. One received royalties and one received a research fund. None were related to the study. Um, slap lesions are fairly common with an incidence of 22%, um, mostly seen in athletes due to the uh, mechanism of injury, namely the repetitive overhead movements. And slap lesions are notoriously hard to diagnose during consultation. There are a few specific tests for uh, the slap lesions, but these have low diagnostic values. Just like the O'Brien test, which, which was uh, designed for the slap lesion, but it had a sensitivity of 64% and an accuracy of 54%. And based on its biomechanical properties, the O'Brien test might be more suitable for the diagnosis of posterior labral tears instead of the slap lesions. We actually have an interesting anecdote that in the clinic, one of the patients who did the O'Brien test actually developed posterior instability whilst doing the test. So it must be taken um, must be taken carefully. And this led to our uh, aim uh, to determine the diagnostic value of the O'Brien test in localizing the labral tear of the, of the shoulder. And we hypothesized that the O'Brien test would be most predictive for the postural inferior labral tears. Uh, the study was performed in the Alps Surgery Institute in France. And we included all the consecutive uh, uh, patients who underwent an arthroscopic label repair. So patients were included who had a label tear and who had a preoperative documented O'Brien test. Patients with concomitant bicep and AC patholo joint pathology were excluded. Um, and during uh, arthroscopy, uh, the definitions of the tears were uh, noted in a 12 o'clock configuration, as you can see here. And to determine the diagnostic value of the O'Brien test on diagnosing the label tears, we did a receiver optive characteristic curve. We were able to include a total of 271 patients. Uh, most of the patients had an isolated uh, label tear. 12% had a combined label tear. And a little bit more than half of the patients had a positive O'Brien test. And on the figure on the right here, you can see uh, a heat map, uh, which demonstrates which label lesions the O'Brien test predicted correctly and the green color corresponds with a higher score. So you can see that the posterior side here has a higher score than the anterior or the slap lesion side. This is the receiver operative curve analysis. The higher the area on the curve, the better the diagnostic value of the O'Brien test is. So a perfect test would go through the upper left corner and then to the right. And you can see that the line with the highest area on the curve is the green line, and that's the one for the posterior labral lesions. The slap lesion is right here in the middle. It's the orange line. The study had a few limitations. It's a retrospective study, and we only included patients with a confirmed label tear. And we weren't the first ones who showed the relationship between the O'Brien test and posterior label tears. Owen and his team did this as well. They showed a sensitivity of 83%, which was actually the same in our study. And they had a specificity of 25%, which was a little bit higher in our study. I think it was 64%. And Lederman actually concluded that combining clinical tests during consultancies is the best way to find pathology. 
So, in conclusion, our study demonstrated that the O'Brien test demonstrates the highest diagnostic value for postural inferior tears and not for the slap tears it was originally designed for. Thank you. Is there any question from the floor? So do you, do you find this uh, application, uh, or the results of your study, uh, uh, changing in your clinical practice? Do you uh, change anything in your clinical practice? Um, I'm still doing my PhD, so I'm not in clinic yet. Okay. <laughs> so I may answer that question because uh, <laughs> Sana did the study for us, but indeed we use the O'Brien test in our everyday practice to confirm the impression of uh, posterior instability or at least the involvement of the posterior labrum in the pain in the shoulders that we examine. Continue to, yeah, you continue to use the MRI or, or arthro MRI to do the diagnosis? Yes, of course, we, we combine this as a clinical test with all the other uh, paraclinical examination, ultra CT scans rather than MRI in our institution, but that's another debate. But yes, we combine this information with uh, the other tests. This is not the uh, subject of your study, but did, did you find uh, also, O'Brien tests positive in patients that have no labrum lesions? Um, yes, because uh, the, the sensitivity and the, and the specificity is not 100%. So, of course, sometimes it, there can be uh, false negatives and false positives. But uh, mainly, uh, when we think of uh, posterior instability because of the history or because of some doubtful images and we have a positive O'Brien test, this is a combination of, uh, of arguments that will yield uh, to thinking that uh, this is a posterior label test. Any other question from the floor? Thank you very much. We'll move on. So welcome our next speaker, uh, Dr. Bonival. And he's going to present the long-term results of arthroscopic bank heart repair with Hillsax Rompissage. Thank you. In case of anterior shoulder instability with subcritical green bone loss and Hillsax lesion, especially when the IC score is above three points, one of the options is to do a bank heart repair combined with the Hillsax Rompissage. This capsular tendinitis of the infraspinatus fills the hill sac lesions and makes it extra articular. We previously reported in the meta-analysis that the risk factor of recurrence is lower is lowered by 4.5 three holes compared to an isolated bank at repair. Besides very good clinical outcomes uh, with a recurrence rate from zero to 15%. There is very low data regarding long-term results in terms of failure and post-instability arthropathy. That's why the aim of this study was to evaluate clinical and radiological outcomes with a minimum follow-up of five years and to identify risk factors of recurrence. We hypothesis that uh, this procedure would provide satisfactory clinical results without any degenerative, degenerative arthritis uh, of the glenoid joint. So in this retrospective single center design study, we included patients with anterior shoulder instability, treated with anterior bone cut repair and heel sac remplissage, and reviewed with a minimum follow-up of five years. Obviously, we excluded the revision cases and patients with a glenoid bone loss uh, greater than 20%. Uh, from surgical point of view, we started with a glenoid preparation, and we inserted the first five o'clock anchors to uh, shift the capsule from south to north and to reinsert the labrum. Then we shift from posterior to anterior uh, to go to the heel sac preparation. And after refreshing the, the bone, we insert two more anchors. From 2010 to 2012, we uh, did a, a, a double mattress design construct. And then uh, we, uh, from 2013, uh, we did something like a bridge design uh, construct for the rampage. 
then we conclude the Bankat Repair with at least two more anchors and tighten for at least uh, the, the posterior uh, uh, suture to uh, do the remplissage of the heel sacs. Clinical assessment was based on measurement of active range of motion. We uh, perform an operation test and evaluate subjective shoulder value. Objective evaluation was based on row and double score, and radiological uh, evaluation was based on an AP view to uh, classify uh, on according Samilson from grade one to grade three. From a database of 273 patients, 30, uh, 37 were actually because treated with a lesionated bound repair, and 175 because treated with a latarche, leaving a cohort of 61 patients uh, um, uh, uh, treated with a minimum follow-up of five years. Unfortunately, uh, seven patients were lost of follow-up and three were revision cases. Uh, so um, the data were available for, uh, for 51 patients. Uh, the mean age were 26 years old and 80% were male, 70% are sports activity and one half contact and swearing sports. More interesting, the mean uh, death of the uh, hill sacs was 18% of the radius of the remote head and the mean glenoid bone loss was 12%. At mean follow-up of 27 months, um, eight patients uh, uh, reported a recurrence uh, as a dislocation or subluxation. 90% occurred during the first postoperative year and uh, additionally 9% had positive apparition tests. Now, if we look at this uh, univariate analysis, we can see that younger age uh, and uh, the death of ill sacs were two bad pronostic factors for recurrence. Uh, in this prospective collecting data, um, uh, faster recovery of active uh, anterior elevation, external rotation, and uh, internal uh, rotation, uh, a greater risk of recurrence. The overall results are pretty good, with a raw score reach 82 points, duplex score 88 points, and subjective shoulder value 89%. 83% of patients were able to return to sport at the same level, with a very low uh, loss external rotation in adduction and abduction, uh, with respectively uh, 7 degrees and 6 degrees. Now, if you look at uh, the, the radiological analysis, we can see that 70% uh, are sign of arthritis, but it was ma mainly a very low grade with a very small osteophyte, less than three millimeters for 14% of these series. The age at surgery was a bad pronostic factors for arthritis at last follow-up. So the first conclusion of this data, of this study, is that uh, the recurrence rates of uh, uh, this procedure is higher than expected, with a rate of 16% at mean follow-up of seven, of seven years, especially when the heel sac is deep and the patient is young. It suggests that uh, um, alternative surgery should be proposed in these two uh, situations. Uh, the second conclusion is that instability arthropathy is 70%, but it was uh, mostly grade one uh, for 40% uh, of this series. Thank you for your attention. We'll take questions. Can I? Yeah, carry on. Uh, thank you for your, sorry, thank you for your paper. Uh, did you measure the hill sex effect just regarding the depth, not regarding the location, the size to the infraspinatus uh, insertion, or if you did, did you find any, any interesting results? No, this is correct. We only, uh, f f we only check where is the, uh, the deepest point of the, of the hill sacs and just measure regarding the, 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 the depth uh, according to the radius of the rumor head. Okay, so they, there may be some influence. We, uh, yeah, we didn't, didn't study that. We, yeah, we didn't really analyze the situation of the sacs, but um, to be honest, when we analyze the on-track on track or off-track concept, uh, I can say that because we checked afterwards that all the sacs was on track, which is surprising. But only the the death of the sacs was a risk factor of recurrence. So you, sorry, to, so your work were only f focused on on track. Hill sacs lesions. We, we, we didn't, but we did. We didn't Posterior. previously, but we did afterwards, and all the sacs was on track in this series. Thank you. 
Just a brief question, if you could. Thank you. Yeah, Nicola, thank you. Christian Gerber showed that after five years in isolated Vancard, he has still to reoperate 20% of the cases. And you showed that this is not the case with an additional remplissage. You only had 10% uh, after one year, is it correct? So it could mean that the remplissage, however, prevent redislocation in the long term? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you. So you continue, we continue, and now I call uh, uh, Dr. De, De Camp to talk us about outer latage with guided technique. So thanks to letting me talk about the arthroscopic guided latage with a cortical uh, button fixation at a long-term uh, follow-up. So we already know that open latarge with a screw fixation gives a good result, low incidence of recurrence, but a high ra rate of uh, reoperation uh, be because of the pain of the screws and high rate of uh, osteoarthritis over Samuelson 1. Uh, Laurent Lafosse developed an arthroscopic latarge still with the screws, and it didn't change anything for the pain with the screws and the rate of osteoarthritis was little. So Pascal Boileau developed an arthroscopic latarge with a suture button fixation with promising short and mid-term result. So the purpose was to report a long-term, at a minimum 10 years, clinical and uh, radiological uh, outcomes of a patient operated by arthroscopic guided latarge with a surgeon button uh, fixation. So we included all the arthroscopic latarge with a minimum of 10 years follow-up. We excluded MDI and uh, failed uh, bone uh, block surgery, but we included the failed arthroscopic bank heart. So we had 81, and at the last uh, follow-up, we, we managed to, to see uh, 50, uh, 52 patients. So the technique, you know it, uh, drilling from the back, uh, splitting from the back and uh, the interior uh, part to, to create a window and to position the coacoid uh, against the uh, glenoid uh, neck. Uh, you put a second button and you tie the knot and uh, c put compression with a tensioner. So mostly male, uh, mostly hyperlax, and uh, one third uh, did uh, competitive sports, and uh, seven uh, patients had a failed arthroscopic bank heart. So uh, at the uh, last follow-up, we, we managed to to find uh, two, uh, two patients with reoccurrence and, and two patients reoperate, one with arthroscopic latarge and one uh, with arthroscopic bank heart. Uh, around 20% of people had uh, apprehension. None of them had uh, art, um, arthroscopic uh, ilsax remplissage. The functional scores were uh, great with uh, almost 90% uh, of SSV. The range of motion uh, was a loss of external rotation one and two around 10 degrees. Uh, two thirds were very satisfied and one, with, uh, one third was satisfied. And about the return to sport, uh, two thirds uh, returned to the same sports uh, and one third uh, changed the sports practice with an SSV sports at 85%. Uh, about the position, as it is a guided technique, we had 90% of uh, subequatorial and 80% of a flush um, position. We had a uh, full migration, and at the time we didn't use a, a tensioner. So about the healing, we had 80% of healed and 20% of uh, fibrous healing and uh, non-union. So about uh, glenohumeral uh, osteoarthritis, uh, we, we did two groups with the primary stabilization, and in this group we found uh, seven, only 7% 7 of uh, arthritis over Samuelson 1. And in the revision uh, surgery, uh, more than 50% of the patient had osteoarthritis. So we managed to find two factors associated with uh, osteoarthritis, which was the previous surgery and the level of sports as a competition. And the osteoarthritis um, impact the pain, the function, and the motion. So this is two cases. This is one case without osteoarthritis, 
previously, but he had a, a previous failed bank card. And at 10 years follow up, we have a, a Samuelson 3 uh, uh, X-ray with a limited uh, external rotation. And this one uh, had a, a, a perfect result with a perfect range of motion and uh, no osteoarthritis uh, at 10 years. So the study has weakness. It's the retrospective study, small kind of small uh, sample size, and all, treat, all patients were treated by the same surgeon. But it's the first uh, to report long-term uh, result of arthroscopic guided uh, button fixation. And there was like two independent uh, observers. So to conclude, uh, at a minimum of 10 years follow-up, arthroscopic uh, guided latarge with a certain button fixation has excellent and durable results with a low recurrence of instability and low rate of uh, osteoarthritis. The arthroscopic guided uh, drill, drilling technique is safe, accurate, and uh, reproducible. And the cortical button fixation gives uh, excellent graft fixation and avoid uh, complication reported uh, with the screws. Thanks. Do we have questions from the floor from this excellent paper? Please. Thank you for this uh, very nice presentation. Do you, uh, have you uh, found any relation between non-union and apprehension, uh, positive apprehension test? Thank you for the question. No, we didn't find anything uh, related to the non-union, uh, the apprehension and the level of sports and the return to sports. Even the migration, because we included the non-union with the migration, and even the migration, the bone block was still uh, uh, um, uh, posterior to the subscap, so the, the patient didn't have more apprehension. Uh, we, we think the apprehension is, uh, is due to the heel sac's uh, lesion, and uh, maybe it will be uh, less apprehension with a heel sac's remplissage. That's a hypothesis. Any more questions? I would like to make one. Uh, you, you referred that uh, you had no apprehension uh, or more instability when you have no non-healing, but uh, did you find any relationship be, uh, between the non-healing and, for instance, the practice of sports or return to the same level of sports? No, we didn't find anything uh, related to this because we think a uh, non-union may be a fibrous union and uh, it, it, it didn't, it didn't give the, the patient more uh, like inferior results. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, it's Dr. Gauchi and he's talking about the bony lesions seen in epileptic patients who are dislocating. Thank you to select this uh, communication. I'm uh, speaking uh, in replacement of uh, Dr. Biget that uh, have a familiar issue and cannot be among us today. So uh, I will know in the literature, uh, Christian Gerber and Tangaraya have proven that in the epileptic patients, the heel sacs lesions is pre predominant and uh, higher, have a higher importance than in the glenoid side. There is also a, a recent study of Emilio Calvo that compared both population and they find about the same uh, results. What we want to do is to make a more analytic uh, analysis of the lesion uh, regarding the morphometric aspects uh, and regarding on the glenoid lesion and the ill sac lesion and compare two groups in epileptic patients and non-epileptic patients. Our hypothesis was that epileptic patients have larger and more engaging bone lesion than non-epileptic patients. Our inclusion criteria was epileptic and non-epileptic patients that were uh, operated by any surgery procedure uh, of stabilization and uh, or not uh, surgery and anterior recurrent shoulder instability. And our exclusion criteria was the posterior instability and the fracture dislocations and the revision surgery. 
we adjusted patients regarding the age, the sex, and the surgery they received. Uh, we have more uh, men than, uh, than women. The ISA score was among three on average, and the number of dislocations was about the same. Uh, the only difference was the difference uh, on the time between the first episode and the surgery uh, that was uh, done. And this was lower for epileptic groups than in non-epileptic group. And we have 25 patients in each group. The heel sex lesion analysis was done on the reformated humerus. We take the, uh, the axis of the diaphysis and we take the larger diameter and the, the, um, sorry, the position on the head of the humerus where the lesion was the larger. And we measure the diameter of the best fit circle, the depth of the lesion, and the width of the lesion. It, is, it has been described by Shaw et al. And the glenoid bone measurement used the PICO method on the, uh, on the, the, the ipsilateral uh, side, uh, the injured uh, side, and we used the reformatted glenoid surface. It was a reformatted oblique uh, reconstruction regarding the surface of the glenoid, and we trace a, a circle around the glenoid bone, uh, the glenoid, and we measure the bone defect according to the method of uh, the PICO to the PICO method. We also evaluate the on-track, off-track aspect of the, uh, of the, of the shoulder, uh, regarding on one side the glenoid track, uh, and using the formula you see uh, over there with a the constant 0.83, and we measure the ILSAX interval. And when the, when the ILSAX interval was under and uh, below the glenoid track, we tell it was on track, and when it was over, we tell it was off track, meaning that it was more engaging lesions. Our results are the following. We found about the same number of ILSAX lesions on both populations. Uh, the difference was on the depth and on the width. The ILSAX lesion was deeper and larger in the epileptic groups, and uh, as you see on the depth, it was 20 two percent of the, the, the diameter of the head for the epileptic group uh, versus uh, nine percent of the head. And on the weight side, uh, it was epi uh, 43 percent for epileptic group versus 28 percent. That is interesting that we can find two thresholds. For the depth, over 20 percent, we have always epileptic patients, and for the width, over for, uh, 40 Patient, for percent of patients, we have uh, mainly, uh, in uh, except one case, uh, the, uh, no, the epileptic patients. On the glenoid side, the difference was uh, not obvious, and we found uh, about the same number of uh, lesions. The size uh, was about the same, and there was a little trend uh, for epileptic patients to present a very important lesion over 20% of the uh, surface of the glenoid. So glenoid bone loss was similar with or without uh, epilepsy. Regarding the on-track, off-track analysis, on the epileptic group, we found that there was 90% of the uh, lesion that was engaging against 30%, one-third only, on the non-epileptic group. And the risk, meaning the odd ratio, was uh, uh, 23 uh, times uh, more important to have uh, an engaging lesion for epileptic patients versus non-epileptic patients. In conclusion, we can tell that epileptic patients have deeper ILSAX lesions and really more engaging lesions than non-epileptic patients. That it can be explained by the violent muscular contraction that digs the humeral head against the glenoid. A second conclusion that we have to suspect an epileptic disorder, and that is interesting to, to know that because it helps you to uh, provide uh, neurologic exams uh, to, in addition to your uh, uh, clinical analysis. If you see humor lesion over 20% of depth and 40% of widths, you can think that your patient is at a high risk to be an epileptic patient and maybe for the glenoid lesion over 20%, but it was not significant in our study. Last conclusion, that in epileptic patients that have most of the time a high, high score over three, uh, we always need a bony stabilization procedure. 
But if you look at the study that has been done by Patrick Rice in uh, 2012, uh, isolated lethargy in epileptic patient gives 50% of recurrency. So we highly recommend to the at least a heel sex remplissage with the bank card, plus or minus a lethargy. And if you do that arthroscopically, you can do both uh, easily. Thank you. Take questions. Uh, thank you, Mark. Nice, nice study. Uh, excellent presentation. My question was regarding the indications for adding or emphasis in these patients. So do you recommend adding or emphasis simply because the patients are epileptic, or it depends on the size or depth of the heel sac lesion? Uh, in fact, uh, our patient in our, in, uh, in our study did not all receive a surgery. So we cannot find... Uh, uh, we cannot uh, give conclusion about the procedure that we can give the best, but uh, if we match our results with the result that was found by Patrick Price, it's fine that uh, we have to do ill sac remplissage at least, and when there is a bony glenoid lesion, uh, we always associate it with the lethargy procedure. If uh, I answer to your question. In case of a huge shell sac lesion, do you consider sometimes to uh, reconstruct it in the same way like a glenoid deficiency with a bone block? Have you never tried to do it? On the humor side? Yes. Yeah. Sure, this seems to be logical. If you do it on a glenoid sit, why not on the, on the for posterior uh, yes. instability or locked dislocations, you do the same. You put in a bone graft and then it's over. That's the end of the story. Absolutely. Why not for anterior one? Yeah, absolutely, and we sometimes we make a 3D model of the humerus, and we uh, calculate the size of the of the grafts we need to uh, to to harvest in on the on the graft on the, the iliac crest, for example, or with the osteopure, and uh, we, uh, we we put it on the humerus side. Yes. Uh, one more question. Yeah, Thank you. I, I'm Yang Li from the South Korea. I want to ask about uh, the humor had. The bone graft instead of the lamplicize. You recommend the lamplicize to reduce the recurrence after the anatage for the epilepsy in the patient. So, yeah, I understand. Uh, we have no special, special experience in in not very depth uh, lesion of the of the humerus to do a graft. We do, only do that for patients that are very deep. Uh, the deep, uh, deep, uh, uh, deep lesion. In fact, we maybe have to uh, increase our indication for graft, but at the moment we do a lot of ill sacs and uh, uh, that give us a good result, but uh, it is, I think, a good, uh, a good pathway okay. to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I Thank look you. forward to your follow-up paper on your outcomes after <laughs> looking at these lesions. Now I call Professor Maristella Sacomano in order to talk us about arthroscopic reconstruction with a collagen membrane scaffold. Hello, good morning everybody. It's an honor for me to be here today. So I have no disclosure for, uh, for this topic. When we talk about anterior shoulder instability, uh, what can we say for sure? We, say, we can say that we really have very, very many surgical options, but the problems, the main problems, is that we have a lot of technique, but we do not have any certainties, or very few of them. What do we know for sure about this topic? We know, or we mostly agree, that an arthroscopic bunker repair can be enough most of the time, because recurrence rates are still too high, unacceptable, if we think that we are talking about very young people. So there's an interesting study that just showed that even if you already have just one preparative dislocation and time to surgery is over six months, maybe an arthroscopic bunker is not enough anymore. So the question is, is arthroscopic bunker just the best option after first time dislocation? I don't know the answer yet, but if the other option is to do a bone block procedure, even arthroscopic or open, you have to consider that there are complications after surgery. And most of the time, this complication, according to the literature, is even higher than soft tissue procedures. So my point is, let's just think about the pathology. 
sometimes is not only a bone pathology. We do not have only bone. We also need to take care about soft tissue. And sometimes maybe soft tissue are the main issue. Uh, recent studies say that if you have a small labral morphology, this is another point that you can have recurrence after an arthroscopic bone cut repair. Moreover, what would you have usually when you operate chronic instability? You have scar tissue. Sometimes you don't even recognize the labrum. So you just do a bunker just using the capsule or stuff like that, or you prefer a bone block procedures even if you don't have a bone defect, just to be sure. Or there are many other underestimated conditions, hyperlax patients, MDI, uh, when you have a loss of glenoid concavity, so a flat glenoid, sometimes you have a labral attenuation. In all of these cases, when you do not have, sorry, when you do not have a bone defect as a major issue, but the major issue is the labral morphology because you have a labral attenuation or scar tissue, I think that the labral augmentation can work because it deepens the glenoid concavity and increase the joint surface area. So the aim of our study was to assess the safety and efficacy of a biologic scaffolding on glenoid labrum reconstruction in the treatment of anterior shoulder instability with insufficiency of the glenoid labrum. We included only anterior shoulder instability. Uh, the insufficiency of the glenoid labrum, of course, was seen during arthroscopy, so at the time of the surgery. We excluded off track lesion, bony bunkard, MDI for this study. And what do we do? Uh, to reconstruct the labrum, we use uh, a collagen membrane. We just rolled up the membrane. The length uh, was based according to the defects, as I can show you in the video. So as you can see, I don't have labrum anymore, or I just have scary tissue. So I prepare, I measure the length of the labrum that I need with a ruler. And then I put a stitch with a PDS suture in the capsule, very low, just to have a traction suture to introduce my scaffold, as you can see. And then the surgery became very, very easy because I just performed a standard labrum repair with a new labrum. So I incorporated capsule and the new labrum and just performed my surgery as usual. In a standard fashion, actually, I usually use a knotless anchor so as usually, I'm going to use three to four anchors according to the size of the defect. And in a sec, you see the final results. So we tried the efficacy of this technique on 20 patients affected by anterior shoulder instability with a mean follow-up of 38 months. We lost no patient at follow-up. We only had one recurrence, which was a traumatic recurrence. Of course, the technique is very easy, um, mainly a banker repair, so we have no intraoperative or postoperative complication. Looking at the results, from a functional standpoint, the results were very good. Uh, so the results improve all the time for row score, DAS score, and WASI score. Uh, but even more important, maybe, looking at the MRI, postoperative MRI six months of, um, after surgery, we can see uh, a kind of soft tissue good integration in all cases. We reconstruct, basically, the anterior limb. Uh, you, can, um, you can compare with the posterior labrum or even with the other shoulder. That's what we did. And according to our, to our examination, the labrum was reconstructed. Uh, very good. So, of course, the study has some limitation. The small sample size with there is a case series, and we do not analyze um, factors that could probably affect the outcomes. But the aim of the study was just to assess the safety and the effectiveness of the procedure. And if they, we think it works very well. So what else? Now we use this technique even in revision cases. If we have no critical bone defect, but a labral insufficiency. This is also a good technique, at least in our hands, for MDI patients. You can reconstruct both anterior and posterior labrum. In order to lower the cost, can you use any alternative graft? Of course you can do. In this example, we use the semitendinosus graft. Thank you for your attention. Do we have questions from the floor, please? Better. Hi, uh, congratulations, interesting technique. So on the healing part, how do you think that um, works? Does it incorporate in your capsule that you put it back or do you think it actually heals through the glenoid? 
Uh, I think you can else because uh, we incorporated the capsule. We also stimulated the bone with the shaver. So I think it is a, a biologic uh, healing of the scaffold. Yes. But as I, as I said, if you don't believe that scaffold can really integrate, you can maybe use a tendon. You can use an autologous tendon, a quadriceps, whatever you think it works best. Any more questions from the floor? Uh, what's your uh, re rehabilitation protocol for these patients? Uh, standard rehabilitation, like after a bank card repair. Actually, I keep my patients uh, four weeks in a, in a sling, and then I start the uh, recovery of the um, range of motion. And two months after surgery, I started I start um, strengthening exercises, and they are allowed to go back to sports in four months. The images that you showed from the MRI are from six months after surgery. Six months after surgery, yes. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, when you have six months after surgery, you still have the scaffold, uh, and uh, it should be interesting to see uh, two, at two years or more. What yeah, of course to the we. Scaffold. Of course, we are doing this with our patient right now, in, both including actually revision cases and MDI. So this was just to prove the safety of the procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next talker is Professor Boileau. He's talking about the arthroscopic triap procedure as a reliable treatment for recurrent anterior instability and massive irreparable cuff tears. Thank you very much. So, uh, the problem of the cuff deficient and unstable shoulder is really challenging because, of course, if the cuff is repairable, this is what you're going to do. And you can add a bank art repair or a tarje. If it's an unrepairable cuff tear with a non-functional shoulder, then you have to do a reverse prosthesis. The problem is that when you have a massive irreparable cuff tear with a pain-free and functional shoulder, no pain, normal range of motion, what are you going to do? This is a very important paper published by Ed Craig from New York in 1984, and he showed that in massive cuff tear, there is sometimes no bank art lesion, since the anterior labrum and capsule act as a hinge while the humeral head is rolling over the anterior glenoid rim. So, as a clinical illustration, this is a lady, 76 year old uh, lady, five anterior dislocation. This is kind of lady we have in the south of France. She's going to swim every day, you know, and she's very active. She has no pain. The biceps is already ruptured. She has a normal range of motion. She has a massive irreversible cuff tear with proximal migration, uh, slight arthritis, and this is a supraspinatus, infraspinatus tear in, uh, in addition to the biceps. No bank art lesion. What would you do? A bank art capsular shift? There is no bank art lesion, and you risk to increase the stiffness of the shoulder. A remplissage with the bank art? No, there is no supraspinatus and no infraspinatus. Again, you risk sh stiff shoulder. A latarge procedure? Yes, you can, but it's risky because you're going to pass through the subscap. A reverse prosthesis? Of course, no. It's, it would be non-ethical because she has normal active range of motion and no pain. So what can you do? Our choice was to do an, a triad procedure. And you know this operation where you do a partial osteotomy of the coracoid process to lower, to medalize, and to posteriorize the uh, uh, coracoid process in order to use the sling effect of the conjoint tendon. This is how it works. This is the weak point of the shoulder in abduction external rotation, and this is how you get the stabilization with the uh, TRIA procedure. So we did the TRIA procedure for this patient. At that time, we were using uh, screws, you see. She's six years for, uh, following surgery. Uh, almost no uh, limited motion and still preserve active forward elevation, no pain and a stable shoulder. And you can see the procedure here with the, on the X-ray. And also, as Gilles has shown, that this is an advantage to lowering the humeral head in those upward migrated uh, humeri. So we have a series of 21 patients that we operate with massive irreparable cuff tear with a mean age of 61 years. You see, it was one, uh, mainly two, two, uh, two tendon tears or three tendon tears, and uh, we use initially a uh, cannulated screw, and then we move to the uh, button fixation. So this is uh, our evolution for the fixation of this uh, operation. And basically, the, the procedure is very simple because 
you don't have to cut the pec minor, number one, you just cut the CA ligament, you drill the coracoid, you drill the glenoid, and you use button or, or anchors, and then you do the partial uh, osteotomy of the coracoid process, and then using uh, our tensioner, we're going to uh, middleize, posteriorize, and uh, uh, lower the coracoid process. As another illustration, this is a 47-year-old man. You see this guy is uh, uh, doing surf, ski, uh, uh, snowboard, I'm, I'm sorry. And he has been amputated of the, uh, one of his legs. And he has a, a recurrent dislocation, as you can see, with non-union of the greater tuberosity. So it means massive posterior superior cuff tear. So, as you can see on the uh, MRI CT scan, there is massive cuff tear, fatty infiltration. What are you going to do for this guy? He has no pain. He has full range of motion. He wants to go back to surf, to snowboard, and he wants to be, to be in the Paralympic Games uh, next year. So this is what we did. We did the uh, arthroscopic tria. You see the, it's very important to, to stay flush with the glenoid surface. This is his motion. No, uh, no limited motion. And this is him going uh, to the paralytic uh, uh, games and being able to snowboard three months after the surgery. And you can see this is the arm he is using to balance uh, his body during surfing. So these are the results of the series of uh, uh, 21 patients here. You see that uh, there is improvement in all scores and return to sports for those who are doing sports. And we, we didn't lose any active forward elevation in those, in those patients. We didn't observe uh, any uh, complication. Only one patient was revised uh, after, after a fall uh, to a reverse prosthesis because it destroyed all the procedure. Regarding the osteoarthritis, there is some increasing of the osteoarthritis. This is uh, obvious. But still, look at this patient. Uh, 65-year-old, five anterior dislocation, massive irreparable cuff tears, fatty infiltration, supraimpharspinatus, and this is uh, the uh, results uh, after uh, uh, six years now also. And you can see that although the X-ray doesn't look very uh, nice because he had arthritis before, he has no pain, he has a full range of motion, he's doing sports like, uh, like crazy, and uh, he, he doesn't complain of anything. And of course, this was not an indication at all for reverse prosthesis. So in summary, don't forget this uh, nice procedure. Uh, it's uh, uh, useful to stabilize the shoulder. The indication is a massive irritable cuff tears with a pain-free shoulder and a functional shoulder, which means preserved range of motion. Contraindication if you have a complete subscap tear, if you have a severe glenoid bone loss, or if you have a pseudoparalysis of the shoulder or loss of active uh, and external rotation. Uh, this, uh, the TRIA procedure under arthroscopy allows you to, make, to have accurate positioning of the bone block, and we uh, have constant bone block healing. And this is an extra articular procedure, which is less technically demanding than the arthroscopic lethargy and less risky uh, for the subscapularis. Thank you for your attention. I will take questions. Adam. I have a question. Where are we, guys? Do you mind if we just start here, this gentleman? Okay, Pascal, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have to confess that I have some bad results with the TRIA procedure, like you described, with lack of external rotation and pain. And for me, it was an impeachment between my bone block and the subscap. And when I made my surgical revision to remove the screw, in fact, there was a wear of the upper part of the subscap and a, a total rupture of a conjoint tendon. So my question is, did you have see this such a complication with the TRIA? No, I, I never seen this complication. It was, your case was traumatic? No, no, it's exactly, exactly the same like you, the same, same patient, but uh, in fact, uh, stiffness of the shoulder, and it, it was uh, uh, an impeachment between my TRIA and my subscap, upper part of the subscap. And you have a rupture of the conjoint tendon? Yes, I, uh, unfortunately, I didn't make the video, but uh, there was, uh, you see, uh, an impeachment between the two tendons, a wear of the upper part of the subscap mm -hmm. and a total rupture of... Uh, no, of I, I never observed that. And I, Gilles has published, as you know, a, ha a huge series of 250 cases doing, done open, and he never uh, reported or observed this complication. 
I think your patient had a traumatic problem. I mean, the thing is that uh, we bring the, the tip of the coracoid very close to the surgical neck, so there is no uh, damage due to the screw. And number one, for the stiffness, you have to move right away the patient. Don't, limit, don't put them in a sling, of course. So, yes, probably you're right. My hypothesis was maybe my trial was too close or too, too stiff onto the glenoid. And maybe the answer is you don't have to push the bone block onto the glenoid, but to keep a gap of maybe a few millimeters to, pre, to, to keep a good uh, exertion of, of the subcap. cap. Okay, thank that's you very why much. the, we'll the suture technique is nice because uh, uh, it's less aggressive than the screw. Me? Just two questions, one from the lady at the back. Hi, did you do any partial repair on these patients of the cuff? If I did this operation with partial tears? No, no, this was a massive uh, rotator cuff tear cases, right? Did you, besides of the trilla, did you do any partial repair of the cuff? In, uh, in this series, we did not, but uh, recently I did a partial repair in, in, a, in a patient uh, where I could do it. Uh, but as you can see, for the case with the non-union, I mean, it's too retracted. You cannot do anything or you're going to make the, the shoulder stiff. So it's better not to, do a, uh, to try to do a cuff repair if it's old and, re and chronic and retracted. Thanks. Yep, one more question. Thank you. I'm wondering 